Good morning. Great to see you today. Thank you so much for joining us in worship. If you're here today for the first time, a special welcome to you. We're so glad to have you uh, joining us on this, uh, this second, second weekend of the month of September. And uh, kind of our last... Kind of our last service, or our, our last uh, service before the, before we kind of move into our fall programming year. Uh, we often like to say, whoever you are and wherever you are on your journey of faith, you are welcome here. And so we're going to move right into our service today. Uh, I'm going to invite you to stand. Our music team is ready to go, and we're going to sing "Welcome," actually. And so let's stand and sing together. Walk together for a while and ask where we begin to build a world where love can grow and hope can enter in to be the hands of healing and to plant the seed of peace singing welcome Let's talk together for a time when we will share a feast. Where pride and power kneel to serve the lonely and the least. And joy will set the table as we join our hands to pray. Singing welcome, welcome to this place you're in. Let's dream together of a day when earth and heaven are one. A city built of love and light, the new Jerusalem. Where morning turns to dancing, every creature lifts its voice, crying, Welcome, welcome to this place, you're invited to come and all are welcome, the Lord of God we share. For all of us are welcome here. All are welcome in this place.
Good morning and welcome. I'm Sarah Sundquist, your worship leader for this morning, and I'm so glad you're here worshiping with us. And for those of you joining us on the live stream and later on in the week in the film service, we welcome you and glad you're with us as well. Please take a moment to fill out the binder that's located at the end of your pew. Um, if you could just fill that out and um, also take out a name tag and fill that out as well. It will come in handy when we gather later for some fellowship. And as you exit today out through the double doors, if you turn left, you will see the restrooms located down the hallway on the left. And if you did not receive one of our little communion cups uh, when you walked in this morning, if you could just raise your hand and let an usher know, uh, an usher will bring one of those to you. Also, we do have a gluten-free option, so if you'd like one of those and you got the wrong one, um, also raise your hand and an usher will, will get that to you. And lastly, we invite you to join us this morning for a time of coffee, snacks, and fellowship downstairs in our social hall immediately following our service. And now Pastor Joe has some other items that he wants to share with us. Sarah. Well, uh, again, it's great to see you today. Thanks so much for joining us. We are, uh, join us as we kick off our uh, fall program next year, next year, next week with uh, Welcome Home Sunday. Uh, it is one week from today. We are going to be gathering uh, everyone back together again, whether that is in person or whether it's uh, virtually. Uh, no, it won't look quite the same as it has in the past, but during our worship times next week at 10 o'clock and at 6 o'clock, uh, we'll hear about our many ministries, our small groups, classes, and outreach efforts. This is a great opportunity to learn about ways uh, that you can uh, serve our congregation and our community. Our Wonder Years program and our youth ministries will be up and running in person. Of course, they are today as well. Uh, during the 10 a.m. service, uh, children will move to their new grade levels uh, next week. We'll have some special treats at coffee hour and a preview of the coming year. So plan now to join us as we say welcome home. Now tomorrow we're going to be having an usher greeter training session on Zoom. Uh, that's right, it's our first usher greeter training ever on Zoom. So um, it's at two o'clock in the afternoon. We're going to see how that goes. If you would like to be part of that, uh, we need your email address. And I just realized, is that Carol and Ed back there? Okay. I just realized that I was supposed to have a clipboard with some paper on it in the very back. Uh, if someone could grab a piece of paper and put it in the back, if you would like to be part of that Usher Greeter Zoom meeting tomorrow and you didn't already receive a Zoom link invite, please write your name and your email on there and we'll get that out to you. It's a great way to plug in and get to know folks in the church as well. Our flowers today up front, flowers right here are from the Classines. They are in memory and honor of their mother, Violet Hardy's Classine. This would have been her 100th birthday. So we celebrate in honor and in memory of Violet today. Very uh, wonderful person in the life of our church. Well, we are going to move into... Uh, another part of our service today, and I'm going to invite the Marvin family uh, to come forward right now, and I'm going to have Sarah come and join us as well. And uh, as they come join us, let me get a few things moved over here. Actually... I'm going to have you come right back down here, I think, Sarah. What I was going to do was say, uh, as they're coming forward, uh, if you wish, this, these words will be on the screen as well, but if you wish to look at them in your hymnal, uh, you can turn to page 44, 
and be ready with the Congregational Pledge number two there on page 44. But it's a, a wonderful time as we uh, welcome Ellison and Finley into our church family today. Brothers and sisters, baptism is an outward and visible sign of the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Our Lord has expressly given to little children a place among the people of God, which we recognize this day. Remember, it was Jesus himself who said, let the children come to me, do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. This morning, we have the joy of welcoming Ellison and Finley into this community of faith. Peter and Susie, do you, in presenting these children for holy baptism, profess Jesus Christ as your Savior and put your full trust in his grace? And do you therefore accept as your privilege to live before these children a life that becomes the gospel, to exercise all care that they be brought up in the Christian faith, that they be taught the holy scriptures, and that they learn to give reverent attendance upon the private and public worship of God? And will you endeavor to keep these children under the ministry and guidance of the church until they, by the power of God, will accept for themselves God's many gifts and be confirmed as full and responsible members of Christ's holy church? Let's pray together. Eternal God, pour out your spirit to bless this gift of water and those who receive it. May Ellison and Finley know your love and blessings. May all things belonging to your spirit live and grow in them. Grant that they will be clothed in your love, care, and constant presence all of their days. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Okay, big guys. You got two big guys there. Okay, and what names are given these children? Let's start here. Mm -hmm. Ellison Shields, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And... Finley Gerard. Finley Gerard, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Brothers and sisters, members of the household of faith, I commend to your love and care these children whom we this day recognize as members of the family of God. Will you endeavor so to live that they may grow in the knowledge and love of God through our Savior Jesus Christ? And the congregation will respond by saying, With God's help, we will so order our lives after the example of Christ that these children, surrounded by steadfast love, may be established in the faith and confirmed and strengthened in the way that leads to life eternal. Let's pray together right now. Would you pray with me? Holy God, grant that Ellison and Finley, as they grow in years, may also grow in the grace and knowledge of you, and that by the renewing influence of your Holy Spirit, they may always be true children of yours, serving you faithfully all of their days. May our God, creator, redeemer, and sustainer, bless, preserve, and keep you now and forevermore. Amen. Well, I want to just spend a moment introducing, we've got Ellison right here, and some of you have seen Ellison at our children's moments before, and with his, uh, with his questions and comments, and uh, we've got Finley over here, and these are, these are their parents, uh, Peter and Susie Marvin, and they have been, uh, they've been attending here probably for at least a couple of years, maybe, maybe a little bit longer than that, so... Um, we welcome them. It's wonderful to have uh, Ellison and Finley uh, baptized today and, and really a part of our church family. So God bless and, uh, and welcome them, yes. Thank you. Now, 
We're going to do uh, our children's special time right now. So if they want to stay right here, uh, you guys can stay right here. I'm going to invite any other children we have to come forward at this time. Hang on, guys. I'll be right back. How's everyone? Whoa, that's pretty loud. I just learned I just learned something that the mic is really loud when it's inside of a mask. How's everyone doing today? Good. I'm going to sit down here and I found some stuff I want to show you today. Have any of you ever seen anything like this before? Do you guys know what they are? Hey guys, come on over. I got to show you something. Come on over here. These are called rubber stamps, rubber stamps. And some of you, so these are some that I got out of our church office. And what you do, I'm just going to use these paper plates. But what you do is you stamp into some, this little pad right here has ink on it. So you don't want to touch that, but you can like stamp into it. And then you go like this. And what did I get on that stamp? It's like the date. Of course, it says December 18th, so it's not today's date. Let's try this one. This one Hmm, that one didn't that one didn't turn out that well. I guess it's not really working. That one's not really working that well. How about this one? Look, it's like a little picture of our church. It's a tiny picture of our church. It's all on a rubber stamp. And how about this one? This one looks like... Oh, look at that. That's our little church sign. It's like our little church sign out front, right? That's our Methodist. And see if you go like that, put one there, put one there, put one all over. Isn't that cool? It's kind of fun to play with, um, have rubber stamps like this, and then you can stamp things on paper and decorate. Now, let me ask you a question. If God had a stamp, what would God's stamp say? Yes, Allison? That's right, that he loves everybody. And so God's stamp, if God had a stamp like this, and you went might say, I love you. God's stamp might say, I love you. Well, what we just did with Ellison and Finley, that was kind of like God's stamp saying, I love you. I love you. I love you. God stamps everyone like that. And so what we do in baptism is kind of a, whoops, hang on, guys. We don't want to get ink all over our hands. So when we have a baptism like that, that's sort of a special ceremony. And that special ceremony says to Ellison and Finley from God that it's almost like God's taking a stamp that says, I love you, and placing it on Ellison, placing it on Finley. So, Ellison, you got a stamp on you today. Nope, don't put your fingers in there. You get ink all over them. Okay, well, let's have a prayer, you guys. Boy, those guys have a lot of energy, don't they? Okay, let's have a prayer together, okay? Dear God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for Ellison and Finley, but we also thank you that for rubber stamps. And we remember that if you had a stamp, 
your stamp would be I love you and your stamp would be for everybody. But especially this day, we had a special ceremony where you said to Ellison and Finley, I love you. Thank you, God, for all these things. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up, you guys. Okay, now, you guys get to go to Summer of Wonder today. And I see Miss Christine is in the back. And you guys can find her. And they're going to head downstairs. As they head downstairs, we have a special musical offering today.
Thank you, Robert and Liz. The scripture today is taken from the book of Romans, chapter 8, verses 14 through 17, 35, 37 through 39. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If in fact we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels nor rulers nor things present nor things to come nor powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Sarah. Gina Wingo, Gina Wingo was a preschool teacher in Arkansas. Gina Wingo was a preschool teacher in Arkansas. On September 11th, 2001, she felt as many of us did horrified and shocked by the images that were coming over her TV screen. As the spouse of a pastor, she had helped in difficult situations before. She had ministered to people in times of trauma. She had supported those who encountered a death. And so in typical fashion there at her preschool uh, 20 years ago yesterday, she attempted to be a source of strength for others. She remembered, I said all the right words to friends that day, my coworkers, I comforted, I nurtured, I reasoned. I never felt fear. After all, it was so far away from Arkansas. Like I said, Gina Wingo was a lot like most of us, shocked, horrified, confused, angry, but also separated by distance from the center of the disaster. And then something else happened. Gina said, it wasn't until I walked outside on the playground with my preschool class that a new understanding overwhelmed me. The sky was crystal blue. There was a hint of coolness in the air, a perfect day for children to run and play. Normally on days like this one, we would watch all the jets fly overhead. I would tell the children about my cousin Sarah, who was a flight attendant on one of those big planes that we watch up in the sky. But this day was different. The sky was empty. It was the strangest thing I had ever seen. Suddenly, she said, I realized I should call home just to ease my mind. That phone call was the beginning of my journey, she said, on what our family has called this trail of pain. I sat in a darkened room of preschoolers who were napping peacefully and innocently as I heard words from my sister-in-law that everyone had dreaded to hear. The airline called. Sarah was on one of those flights. In despair and agony, Gina Wingo said, Evil had entered my personal world. And I think in some way that is difficult to explain, that's what happened to all of us on 9-11. Evil and hatred had entered our world. It's not that we necessarily had a personal connection to someone like Gina had, 
but that in something like a wave that moved across this nation, we connected both emotionally and spiritually with those on the East Coast. Our hearts were so much with them that their pain was our pain. Their despair was our despair. Their grief was our grief. Not only did the world around us change on that day, but our faith was shaken as well. In some sense, like Gina, we all of us embarked on a trail of pain. You know, most of us in the church talk about suffering at one time or another. We say bad things sometimes happen to good people. We say that. And we might even tell people that we believe that. But you know, most of the time, we don't really fully deep, deep down believe that when it is about us. Most of the time we think that if we're good and we try to be kind and we try to be compassionate and try to live a good life, that, that God's going to make everything go right for us. And I think one of the things that we struggled with the most is that, like few other times in our lives, 9-11 threw that assumption right back at us. Those of you who have listened to any one of dozens of special programs on TV this past week, no doubt heard story after story after story from ordinary folks who did extraordinary things, people who helped others in the Twin Towers, sometimes with incredible acts of courage, you know, going back up when they could have been going down and out to safety. The woman who was buried in rubble for 27 hours and survived. People on Flight 93 who rose up in heroism. People at the Pentagon, firefighters, police, and others who selflessly serving and caring, who were selflessly serving and caring, and in some unfathomable way lost their lives in the process. How do we make sense of that? How do we make sense of that? When I say that their pain became our pain, their grief was our grief, I mean, it, I mean that it happened on the East Coast, but it happened to all of us as well. A lot has been said about how truly united we were in those days as we faced an unexpected threat. And a lot's been said about how much less <laughs> united we are right now as we face a very different kind of a threat. I don't know what happened here in Reading, but uh, when I, where I was in Santa Rosa, we all came down to the sanctuary. Some folks came that very evening. But then I remember we put out flyers, and I think it was Thursday or Friday night, we held a prayer vigil. And the sanctuary was packed. It was packed. Person after person, people that I didn't even know, people who never attended church were there sharing their feelings with one another, just having a place to express themselves. 9-11 and our nation's response can bring up scores of theological questions about evil, hatred, our desire for revenge, our capacity for racism, possibility of participating in the very evil that we most seek to resist. I remember going to a restaurant in Santa Rosa a couple of weeks after 9-11. And this restaurant was sort of a mix of kind of American and Middle Eastern food. The people who owned it might have been from Pakistan, some, somewhere like that. Anyway, one afternoon I went in there, I was, talking with the, I was talking with the server, and I realized that he was very upset. And when I asked him what was wrong, he said he feared that they may not be able to stay in business. The number of people eating at that restaurant had dropped by about 75%. They had received threats as well. Here in supposedly open and welcoming Santa Rosa was retaliation and backlash and persecution due to race or nationality. One of the things that amazed me in the days after 9-11 was that people immersed themselves in sort of 24-7 news coverage of 
terrorist activities. I mean, including, you know, there, there was every story about everything that could possibly, you know, stories of nuclear and biological weapons and reporters who never tired of looking for worst case scenarios. I knew a lot of folks who were literally glued to CNN in, uh, you know, pretty much all the time. Maybe you were one of them. Within weeks, you know, psychologists were seeing huge increases in people uh, who were agitated and depressed and some even paralyzed with fear. In the midst of that chaos, in the weeks right after 9-11, the United Methodist Church started running a series of TV ads. And you know what the tagline was for those ads? The tagline was, fear is not the only force at work in the world today. Fear is not the only force at work in the world today. Frankly, it's something we desperately needed to hear. Frankly, it's something we need to hear today. I used to think that the opposite of fear was courage, but I later realized that true courage is not necessarily the absence of fear. As many of our first responders and servicemen and women have discovered, Courage is often moving ahead and doing the difficult thing in spite of your fear. I later came to believe that the opposite of fear is love. <laughs> the opposite of fear is love. As that great line from scripture tells us, perfect love casts out fear. Perfect love casts out fear. And so no, fear is not the only force at work in the world today. Love is at work in our world as well. In the passage that Sarah read for us from the book of Romans, Paul uses some language that reminds us of the people of Israel being led out of Egypt. He says, all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. He says, for you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. In other words, Paul is saying we are no longer strangers, outsiders, we have been adopted brought into God's family. What Romans helps us to do is to push through into kind of a new perspective, not a human perspective, but a God perspective. You know, what's the God perspective on this thing? It's the knowledge that time and space and past and future pain and suffering, even life and death are just a few of the things our souls may encounter, but that those conditions pale in comparison to a larger reality, our connection to the living Christ, whose presence supersedes and overrides all of these. We understand from this passage that our bond with God transcends suffering and even transcends death. I think for those who understand this and trust this, there really is a freedom in how they live. We see it in cancer patients and survivors. We see it in those who put themselves in harm's way on a regular basis. The other night I saw part of a program about Flight 93, the plane that would have hit, probably hit the US Capitol. And you know, because of phone calls to loved ones and snippets of conversations that were recorded, you know, they have a pretty good idea of what happened on that flight. And you know, for the people who were on there, a decision was made. A decision was made by those folks that superseded their fear and superseded their personal safety, a decision to try to gain control of that plane. One passenger, I'm pretty sure it was Todd Beamer, asked an operator on the ground to say the Lord's Prayer with him. She did. In that moment, in spite of fear, no doubt, and uncertainty, I believe he could say with Paul, I am convinced that neither death nor life, present nor future, powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. About a year after 9-11, Gina Wingo, the preschool teacher, wrote this about her own experience. Gina says, part of my spiritual journey since September 11th has been the constant struggle to remember that God is with each one who is traveling this trail of pain and that it isn't up to me to fix it. 
She says, I'm used to rushing in to fix things. Some things can't be fixed. They must be lived out, struggled through, one day at a time. She says, God has been with me through the death of my cousin, through difficult, life-changing decisions, through the ups and downs of she and her husband's ministry, through her own personal illness, and through the struggles of being a parent, as well as through joy-filled and happy times. Perhaps Gina's experience can help us move our understanding, can help us to shift our perspective from a God who simply rewards, for good, rewards us for good deeds to a God who walks the trail of pain, the trail of life and death, and even beyond death, with us. Walks with us through joy and thankfulness. Walks with us through pain and turmoil. Tom St. Clair was a United Methodist District Superintendent in Western Pennsylvania. He worked right near the place where Flight 93 went down. And for several days following that crash, he found himself helping and supporting and caring for the families of those who had died. On September 17th, Reverend St. Clair was leading a memorial service near the site of the crash. The crash with both common folks and those who were famous, who had come to pay their respects. He remembered it this way. He said, as I preached a short message, I looked into the eyes of those with whom I found myself. He said, a strange yet powerful look was in their eyes. We were people looking for comfort, people looking for hope. Gathering together was and always is important as we share our life and faith. He said, but on that day, it didn't matter if the person was our first lady, a secret service agent, an airline official, clergy or family member. We all had those same sad yet powerful eyes. Our God was very much at work in words, in gestures, in acts of kindness, even a smile from a tear-filled face. He said, I remember Todd Beamer's father who sought me out afterwards to tell me how proud he was of his son. Everyone was hurting, scared, angry, sad, and yet they were hopeful, and yet they were filled with hope because our God was active and alive in that place, because our God was present, because God has the final word. In the book of John, we are told that God's logos, God's word, God's active presence is light, the light of all people. We're reminded that God's light shines even in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Friends, as we go forth on this day, this weekend of remembrance, that's the image I hope that we carry with us. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. As we prepare for prayer, I want to invite uh, our musicians to come forward at this time. And as our musicians come forward, let us be prepared. Well, please join with me in prayer. Would you pray with me? Loving God, like those people in Pennsylvania, we come here today 20 years later with sad yet powerful eyes. The sadness is for the pain, the hurt, the turmoil. It is the sorrow for lives destroyed and dreams unfulfilled. We bring sorrow also for the loss of innocence and security that we have known in this country for anger that we continue to hold in our hearts. But the power we bring is the knowledge that our connection to you is ultimately stronger, that your presence supersedes, overrides, overcomes the darkness, and nothing, not even death, can separate us from your great love for us. Send us forth this day as bearers of hope. Send us forth as representatives of Christ those who transform fear with love, those who transform death with new life. In the name of your loving son, Jesus, 
In his name we pray this. Amen. I'm going to invite our ushers to come forward, and as they come forward, let us be prepared to receive our morning offering. Standing at the window, hidden by the night, harboring the private wounds, safe and out of sight. There's an agony in living, but there's a comfort in the truth. No one knows my heart better than you. I can face a lot of people with the sanguine act of mine, guarded by the eloquence I sometimes hide behind. But it's a veil of false pretenses that you can't see right through, because no one knows my heart better than you. comes to you, I am a doorway you're free to walk into, cause no one knows my heart better than you. There's a comfort in the truth No one knows my heart Oh, no one knows my heart No one knows my heart Better than you Please be seated. I want to mention a few people that we are holding in prayer right now as we move into our prayer time. Uh, we just became aware of these folks being in the hospital um, really after the service last week. Uh, Mercedes Bailey was in the hospital. Uh, last weekend, uh, and 
but is doing better now and is at a rehab facility. But let's keep Mercedes in our prayers. And then Dick Farley was also in the hospital uh, following a, a fall and a broken leg. So um, uh, Dick is also out of the hospital and at a rehab facility at this time. But let's keep Mercedes and Dick Farley in our prayers. Uh, of course, their families as well. Uh, we celebrate with the family and thank God for the blessing of Violet Classine and her life and ministry here. We continue to pray for Charlene Brown, who is struggling with numerous health issues. Roy Player, as he continues to recover. A prayer I just got from Mabel uh, just before we came into the service. Mabel's friend, uh, who some of you know as Frankie Bobo, Frankie Bobo, Mabel's friend, uh, passed away this, during this past week. So let's uh, hold uh, Frankie Bobo's family in our, in our prayers, but also Mabel, because she was a, a dear friend of Mabel's, and some of you also knew her in this church family as well. Let's bring our hearts together now and come together in a time of prayer. Would you pray with me? Loving God, this morning we gather here in this place to worship and to be with you and to be with one another. Lord, your blessings do surround us. The, the beauty of the morning, friends and neighbors who are here, the joy of baptisms and celebrating with the Marvin family. Lord, we begin and end by saying thank you for your grace and for your presence. It has been a, a difficult week for our nation, Lord. Even 20 years later, the hurt is still there. We struggle with the feelings that we identify, the sadness, the anger, the pain of lives lost. God, surround us during this time. Surround us with your stillness. Let us know that you are indeed an ever an ever-present help to us. You have heard our voices raised this morning with prayers of concern for congregation members who are ill. We pray also for those who are traveling, those who may be suffering chronic conditions. Lord, be also with those who are uncertain, those who must daily struggle with not knowing about health or job or future or about their dear friends. Lord, be a safe harbor, a place of safety where when the wind and waves of life surge all around us. Today, we continue to pray for firefighters who are dealing with so many active fires in, in very difficult conditions. We continue to lift up those who may be in danger, those who may need to evacuate from their homes. Pray for others this day and this week who are struggling. Loving God, help us to open our souls to your guidance. Help us to be your hands and heart in this world. We lift all these prayers to you now as we pray together the prayer that your beloved son taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We come once again to the table this morning. We're grateful to be, gather, to be able to, to gather and to share the sacrament uh, together, uh, whether we're here in person or whether we're viewing online. Whenever we gather, we are like that group of disciples that sat with Jesus on the night that he was betrayed. On that night, as Jesus shared the Passover meal with his disciples, 
uh, he took the elements of that meal and gave them a brand new meaning. First, he took the bread, and after giving God thanks and praise, he broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Whenever you do this, remember me. And then again, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And after giving God thanks and praise, he gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink this, each of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink of this, remember me. And so as we do each week, we do remember. We remember in a way that brings the very presence of the risen Christ back into our midst. We like to say truly, he is present here with us this day. Just as we share this one cup, we are reminded that we are one body in Christ, connected to one another, connected to Christ, connected to others that are viewing this service either now or later this week, connected to our other congregation. And just as we share bread that has been broken, we are reminded that each one of us is broken in some way in need of God's love, in need of God's forgiveness, and in need of God's healing touch. And so we come to this holy sacrament in that spirit. As you came in today, you should have received a little, a little hourglass-looking cup. What I like to, how I like to instruct people is to turn it so the wafer is on the top and peel that back, flip it over so the wafer is there, and then uh, with the juice on the top, peel back that top piece receive the wafer and juice together in that fashion. As you feel led to do so, please receive these elements uh, this day. My friends, the bread of life given for you, the cup of God's love shared with you, receive now these holy gifts in great thanksgiving.
Oh man, thank you music team. And thank you to all of you for being here this morning. Great to have you worshiping with us. I hope that you'll join us downstairs for a time of fellowship and sharing following our service today. I'm gonna to invite you to stand right now so we can be together for our sending forth. Receive now our benediction. My friends, go now in peace. Love God and serve the people. And may our God, the God whose light shines in the darkness, the God whose darkness has not overcome it, may that God go with you now and through this coming week. Go in God's peace, go in God's presence, and go in God's grace.